That was very sweet. Thank you, Salam. I invite you to open your Bible this evening to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians, chapter 5. Last Sunday night, we spoke on the subject of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And this evening, I would like to continue that, take it the next step. So we'll entitle this, The Filling of the Holy Spirit, part two. Part number two. There is so much to be said about the Holy Spirit. We could literally preach Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for weeks and months and possibly for years and still not exhaust the subject of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot to, a lot to learn. And so in Ephesians chapter five, and I direct your attention once again to verse 18 and keep your seats, but I'd like you to read that verse out loud with me. Ephesians 5, 18, read it out loud and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. And of course, uh, filled is a verb. The verb is present tense. So the idea is not to be just filled once. It's being constantly filled day after day. And listen to this hour after hour. And it's a habit that we have to get into. You know, there are habits in life that are good habits. And then there are habits in life that are not so good habits. I suppose that brushing your teeth is a good habit. Would you say? There was a sign on the doctor's uh, window we saw in the office of the, uh, not the doctor, the dentist, the dentist's window had this big sign in it. And it said, brush your teeth at night to keep your teeth, brush your teeth in the morning to keep your friends. <laughs> it's a good habit, good habit to get into. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is a good habit to get into. You know, when two young people marry, it's a good habit for them to get into, to tell each other that they, they love each other. That's a good habit. Believe it or not, there are couples that have been married a long time. They never say, I love you to each other. How about that? They can be married for years and they never, they never embrace. They never say, I love you. And that's not a good habit. It's a good habit to get into showing affection. By the way, it's also a good habit for parents to tell their children, I love you. And it's a good habit for children to tell their parents, I love you. So we need this reciprocal. We need to hear it is the thing. We need to hear it. The joke about the, the guy who married his beautiful wife and he said, I love you. And if it ever changes, I'll let you know. So he, that was it. That's told her once. I love you. <laughs> now that's not a good habit. Getting into the habit of asking the Lord to fill you with the Holy spirit every day is a good habit. And I suggest to you that you're smarter to ask in the morning than you are at night. At night, when the day is done, you're about to go to bed. Sure. You can ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy spirit. Of course. But what happened all day? You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the morning and in the afternoon and in the evening. That is just the truth of the matter. And so we're going to take this now, the next step, and we're going to look at it analytically. Can I use that word? And we're going to look at it biblically. And we're also going to look at it charismatically as well. I think we'll throw in a little bit of that as well. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our heavenly father, we pause once more and with much joy and gratitude, we tell you that we love you, Lord, and that we just worship and adore you. You are so much everything to us, in fact, and we know that it pleases you to give to us the filling of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And dear heavenly father, we ask for that now. We know that the filling of the Holy Spirit will not result in a bunch of gibberish and gobbledygook and craziness, but it'll result in Christ-like behavior. And we need that. So please bless our study tonight. All who are here present, 
in the church auditorium and all who are here present online, the virtual church will, will say each and every one who's tuned in and will give you the praise and glory in Jesus. Wonderful name. Amen. Well, Ephesians 5, 18 and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. This is actually a command. Did you know it's not an option? It's actually a command that's given to us. After we're saved, we are commanded to be baptized. We're commanded to join ourselves to a Bible believing gospel preaching church. We're commanded to do a number of things. And one of the things that we're commanded to do is to be filled with the spirit. Now, you have to know why you need to be filled with the spirit. Okay, Lord, if that's your will, just fill me with the spirit. If that's what you want. All right, I'm willing. Just go for it. You know, whatever. You're not going to get it. You won't get it. You, you have to know why it is. Now I've used this illustration before. I'm going to use it again because I think it's a very good illustration, but supposing that, you, you know, someone goes into a bank, maybe you or someone else, they go into a bank. Can I speak to the loans officer? Oh yes. Right this way. And they, they usher you in, in front of this finely dressed man or woman, and they introduce themselves as the loan officer. Uh, and they jokingly say, you could call me the lone ranger. Ha ha. Little banker's joke. Well, what can I do for you? Well, I'd, I'd like to take out a loan. All right. And how much did you have in mind? Oh, a hundred thousand sounds like a good amount. Don't you think? Wouldn't you say, oh yes, I'd say that was a good amount. A hundred thousand dollars. And the loan officer takes out the paperwork and says, what is your name? Fills it in. Says, now, $100,000. Now, he puts the pen down. What do you want the money for? And the person says, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. And you know as well as I, the loan manager is going to push back, you know, from the table, the desk and say, well, you know, this is an important consideration. We have to know what you want the money for. We, we can't just throw money at people. And then the person sitting there says, well, I don't know. You see my friends, they all seem to have money and they seem very happy and I want that. And so banks are where you get the money from. So here I am. And so I want to take out a loan of a hundred thousand dollars. So I'll be happy. And the loan officer will probably say, well, uh, Sorry, no can do. Like if you wanted to buy a house, perhaps, or, or a condo, an apartment, if you wanted to maybe even buy an expensive car or something like that, then you have a reason why you want the money. Uh, but just to say you want money just for the sake of having money, it's not going to work. Similar principle when it comes to the filling of the Holy Spirit. What do you want it for? What would you do with it? That's what we have to figure out, right? We can't just say, okay, Lord, I want the filling of the Holy Spirit because my friends have it. That's not going to get it. It's not going to work. We have to understand what is the reason why it is that we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of like what I want to look at here tonight. But something that <laughs> I want to just touch on tonight is some of the crazy charismatic ideas of the filling of the Holy spirit, because you know, God bless them. The charismatics provide a lot of entertainment. They really do. Uh, their TV programs or whatever. When you know the truth, watching them, sometimes it's, it's hilarious. Some of the stuff they come out with, I'm telling you the truth. Now, not everyone tied up with the charismatic movement is like what I'm about to share with you. But there's enough of them out there that, uh, boy, we, you know, if red flags should be going up. We should, we should be careful because folks, we've been given a blessed Bible and with the Bible, we can determine right from wrong, truth from error. And the way we do it is we use two important tools. Number one is called the literal method of interpreting the Bible. We, we could expand that and say the literal grammatical historical method, understanding the scriptures as they were originally given, you know, the normal common sense method. If it says a thousand, it means a thousand. Unless of course, later it, it says a thousand doesn't mean a thousand. It means something else, but they used figure of speeches back then. We use figures of speech today. Hmm? 
Uh, we have different grammatical tools we use today in communication. But that's the first tool. The second tool is context. If you walked into a room uh, and a, a woman looked at a man, a woman was talking to a man and, and she said, I'm going to kill you. You'd think, oh, I better call 911. I better call the police. A murder is about to happen. Time out here. What's the context? Well, that's what you missed by coming in late. The context was, she said, I was watching a TV program last night. And this lady said to another man, I'm going to kill you. But you missed all of the context. And you came in when you did. And all you heard was, I'm going to kill you. And you see, that's one of the cardinal sins that our charismatic friends commit when they look at things like tongues and the filling of the Holy Spirit and things like that. They take a verse out of its context. If you break those two rules, you can make the Bible say anything, anything, anything you want it to say. And that's exactly what's happening. A guy named Jay Snell was a Southern Baptist evangelist who got fed up and became a charismatic. <laughs> There's quite a conversion. And here's what he wrote. The Holy Ghost is another term for the Holy Spirit. And then he says the feminine aspect of the divine. Oh, really? <laughs> this I got to hear. He says it's the fire uh, and it's a symbol of purification and power. So if Jesus says we can be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, that means we can be purified with the Holy Ghost. In other words, she will fill us with her power. <laughs> I find this amazing. Uh, she will surround us with her love. She will embrace us until we know deep down inside that she is with us, in us, all around us. We'll be immersed with divine power. This is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No, it's not. It's not. It has nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what Jay Snell says. That's what he wants it to be. That's not what the Bible says. Because he's broken the two cardinal rules. All right. Here's something that I copied from the internet. Someone wrote, recently I was watching a videotape containing footage from churches participating in the Toronto blessing, quote unquote. That's a deluxe charismatic meeting. I was sickened and disturbed by the occult and animal like manifestations, which I witnessed. I would like to examine a behavior, which I witnessed over and over on this video in videos from the Brownsville assembly of God. And which I have also seen from time to time in spirit filled services in which I've participated. This behavior is commonly labeled being drunk in the spirit. That's another catchphrase for the charismatics. Those in this state exhibit certain signs, staggering, falling down, slurred speech, impaired mental functioning and bizarre behavior. People leaving these renewal meetings have been reportedly pulled over by police for drunk driving. Here, a charismatic who's involved in this, her name is Catherine Riss, R-I-S-S. She wrote a, a song. Well, I guess a poem. Maybe she sings it. It's called New Winos Drinking Song Number One. Why would anyone save person who loves the Lord write such trash? But listen, if you feel too serious and kind of blue, I've got a suggestion. Just the thing for you. It's a little unconventional, but so much fun that you won't even mind when people think you're dumb. Just come to the party God is throwing right now. We can all lighten up and show the pagans how. Christians have more fun and keep everyone guessing since the Holy Ghost sent us the Toronto blessing. I used to think life was serious stuff. I wouldn't dare cry and I acted kind of tough until God's spirit put laughter in my soul. Now the Holy Ghost got me and I'm out of control. Now I'm just a party animal grazing at God's trough. I'm a Jesus junkie and I can't get enough. I'm an alcoholic for that great new wine because the Holy Ghost is pouring and I'm drinking all the time. I just laugh like an idiot and bark like a dog. If I don't sober up, I'll likely hop like a frog. 
I'll crow like a rooster at the break of day because the Holy Ghost is moving and I can't stay away. I'll roar like a lioness who's on the prowl. I'll laugh and shake, maybe hoot like an owl. Since God's holy river started bubbling in me, it spills outside and now it's setting me free. So I'll crunch and I'll dip and I'll dance round and round. The pew was fine, but it's more fun on the ground. So I'll jump like a pogo stick and then fall to the floor because the Holy Ghost is moving and I just want more. Copies are available after the service tonight for a small donation. But this stuff is bizarre. It's very entertaining on the one hand, but you know, it's really sad on the other because the devil is using this to dupe and con people. And there's a lot of good, nice people that are being duped into thinking that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is going to exhibit in all kinds of this ludicrous behavior. And I think it's maybe because of the lunatic fringe that so many of us swing the pendulum too far the other way, almost to the point of denying that there really is a Holy Ghost. When we see what's going on in some of those charismatic parties, we say, You know, I may not have all the Bible answers, but I know deep in my soul that ain't right. And so we, we shut up when it comes to the Holy Spirit, but we ought not to because the Lord Jesus is the one who told us about the comforter and how the comforter would come. And he did. And on the day of Pentecost, he came and the baptism of the Holy ghost is where he baptizes us into one body. So we're no longer Jew. We're no longer Gentile. We're a new body, Christ's body. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. Now, the filling of the Holy Spirit is where we yield the control of our lives to him. And the Holy Spirit now takes over and makes us more like Jesus. Now, this is the reason you need the Holy spirit. You have a reason. Now you can go into the spiritual bank of heaven and sit down with the heavenly father, point out to the father that you have a need for the Holy ghost. And you're looking for a loan of the Holy, the power of the Holy spirit in order to make you more like Jesus. Because truth is when you're in control of your life, when I'm in control of my life, what happens? Stuff we don't want to talk about. Because if we're walking in the flesh, we're just going to pattern ourselves after the world. We're going to think the way of the world. We're going to speak the way of the world. We're going to behave and act the way of the world and the lusts of the flesh and the lusts of the eyes and the pride of life are going to get the better of us. And it results in sin, which results in guilt. And according to James, he said, sin, when it is finished, bring it forth death. And so after you sin, you could almost sit back and say, what have I just killed? What blessing in my life have I just put the sword into? What have I just done? That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We cannot live the Christian life. I'll tell you a little secret. There's only one person that can live the Christian life here tonight. And that's the Lord Jesus because it's his life. There's no way we can live his life. We need him to live his life through us. How is that possible? This is the whole secret about being a born again Christian. It's the power of the Holy spirit that Christ now can live his life through us. You now know why it is. You need the Holy spirit. You can legitimately go to the father and plead on praying ground. Plead your weakness. Plead your inability. Plead for his glory. Father, on the basis of your word, grant to me the filling of the Holy Spirit. And if we would pray something like that day by day, I think very soon we would start to notice a difference. When the Holy Spirit begins to take control it seems that those bad habits, they don't have as hard, you know, tight a grip on us anymore. 
We, we seem to rise above and we, the air is cleaner. The joy is sweeter when the Holy Spirit is allowed to take over. So you see, this is what we're talking about here tonight. Gideon was filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, take, are you taking any notes? Write this down, would you please? Judges chapter 6, verse 34. Gideon allowed the Holy Spirit through him to accomplish a victory. Write down Judges 14, verse 6. Verse 6 and 19, by the way. Judges 14, verses 6 and 19. And chapter 15, verse 14. Read about Samson. When the Holy Spirit came upon him. Write down 1 Samuel 10.10. 10. 1 Samuel 10.10. 10. Saul even. And he was the, the, he ended up being the idiot king. He was saved. But in the early days. The Holy Spirit had come upon him. Write down Luke chapter 2. Verses 25 to 27. You'll read about a man named Simeon. A godly man named Simeon. See what the Holy Spirit did through him in Luke chapter 2. Write down Luke chapter 1, verse 15, and chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. And read about John the Baptist and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so, what is the basic need, the basic goal when the Holy Spirit is allowed to come in and take over control and direction of your life. What is it that the Holy Spirit's going to do? For this, I want you to turn back a few pages. You're in Ephesians there, are you? Turn back to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. You have it? Because I'm going to need your help. I want you to read a verse with me. Verse number 20. Galatians 2.20. Some of you have it memorized. Let's read it together now, shall we? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is spirit filling right here. Spirit filling where we kind of, so to speak, die and get out of the way. And the Lord Jesus, so to speak, you know, gets behind the steering wheel and he, he drives the ship. Now, when Paul says, I am crucified, he puts that in a present tense, present tense, just like being filled with the spirit is in present tense. So is being crucified every moment of every day. You want to die to self and you want to be alive in the spirit. This is the whole secret to the Christian life, the victorious Christian life. And it's a habit to get into. And I'll be honest with you tonight. I, I am not in the perfect habit. I wish I was, but I am not in the perfect habit. And I'm not trying to give anyone an excuse to say, Oh, if the pastor's not in a perfect habit, then I don't have to be in a perfect habit. Listen, maybe you can be in a perfect habit. Maybe I can learn from you. But we're all supposed to be in the perfect habit of dying to self and living in the Lord Jesus. That will only happen when the Holy Spirit's allowed to take over. And so the basic goal, the direction, the oomph for the Holy Spirit is to form Christ in us. This is what he's wanting to do. Because when Jesus Christ is now allowed to have free reign in our lives, that's when the miracles happen. That's when the speech becomes wonderful. The thoughts become pure. That's when the actions become the will of God. Then we can go to bed at night and put our head on the pillow and feel no regrets, no guilt over having messed up. You know, Sundays are a wonderful day. Don't you love the Lord's day? Amen. And don't you notice kind of a, a spiritual feeling after church? Haven't you noticed that? Yes. How many have noticed that? Raise your hand if you've noticed that. All right. That's most all of us. That has something to do with the filling of the Holy Spirit. The devil didn't put that in you. 
You didn't leave church walking with Jesus because the devil encouraged you. You left church walking with Jesus because the Holy Spirit encouraged you. So that gives you an idea. Can you imagine carrying that through the week now? All Monday, you have that Sunday feeling. Huh? That's what we want. And that's what this world needs to see. And you probably have unsaved people that you work with at work or go to school with or neighbors or maybe even unsaved family members. And they're looking at you. Well, they don't need to see another worldly person. They need to see Jesus. And that's the whole idea behind the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's trying to accomplish. Now turn back, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7. And let's take a look here at the words of our Lord. John, chapter 7. Here the Lord Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And um, he says something very interesting. John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast. Now the feast here is the Feast of Tabernacles. You can jot that down somewhere in your Bible. It might help you. It's the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar called Tishri. The Feast of Tabernacles. And so Jesus was there and uh, he, in the last day, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, what in the world is he talking about? Look at the next verse. But this spake he of the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So he hadn't gone to heaven back to heaven yet. The resurrection hadn't happened. The crucifixion was yet to happen. And after all these things happened and he went back to heaven, then he sent the Holy spirit. And so here the Holy spirit is something like an artesian well, you know, coming up within us, bubbling up within us. And that is what the Holy spirit loves to do. The Holy Spirit loves to surprise and comfort with joy and peace. And it comes up like, like that. Maybe you've been in times in your life where you were in peril or danger or terribly discouraged or afraid. And at that moment, you just cried out to the Lord and God gave you peace, maybe peace and joy. Well, that is an experience of the filling of the Holy Spirit. You really have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Numerous times, you just didn't know it. You just weren't aware of it. But you were filled with the Holy Spirit and you never spoke in tongues. And you never will. Because modern day tongues is nothing, nothing like biblical tongues. You can trust me on that one. Now, let's, um, do we have that overhead? Okay. Uh, put that up. Is my clicker working? Am I licensed to click? Am I good? Okay. Can you make it do its thing? I had it all set up there. I don't know. This modern technology. I had it all fixed up. Maybe I didn't save it or something. If you don't save your work, you know, that's whew, it's a lot of, Time down the drain, I tell you. All right. Pastor Devian, he's our computer magician. So, is it ready? It's ready. There. There we go. All right. Let's look at these real quick. Now, you're in John. Turn back to Ephesians. Would you go back to Ephesians, please? Pastor Devian, how did that happen? Did I not save it? Tell me later. All right. We're in Ephesians chapter five. Okay. Ephesians chapter five and verse number 19, 19. Would you read that out loud with me, please? Speaking to yourselves in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are not all the same. They're not all the same thing. It's not the different ways of saying the same thing. A psalm is a song sung with a harp. That's what a psalm is. It's usually a personal experience talking about what happened to you and teaching about God. That's what a psalm is. P-S-A-L-M, a psalm. Now, a hymn is a song of praise. That's what a hymn is. That's why uh, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed and he had the, the Lord's Supper and all that, it says when they had sung a hymn, they went out in the night. It doesn't say when they sung a psalm, but when they sung a hymn. A hymn is a song of praise, praise to God. And then spiritual songs talk about spiritual things. They're songs about heaven, about being saved, things like that. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. This is spiritual singing. <clears throat> it's one of the evidences, <clears throat> the fruit, if you will, of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes over in your life. There's going to be some of this stuff here. You're going to at least have a I, pastor. I can't sing. I can't hold a tune in a bucket. You say, I couldn't get up there and sing a song like the choir, the special musics. Boy, they'd throw hymn books at me. Well, no, they won't because they're not in the pews there at all. All right. Then they'd throw something else, but I can't sing. Well, join the club. None of us really are that good. We're not good for heaven's choir. We're not that good, but we can make a joyful noise. We can all do that. And you know, in the ears of your father in heaven, that's the best music. That is the best music. Pastor Tim, does Titus sing? He does. And how perfect, pitch perfect is he? He's not. Oh, poor little guy. I bet you just hate it when he sings, eh? You don't hate it, really. Do you just kind of put up with it? You enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Now, those of you who are parents, when your little children would sing, did you enjoy it? Yes. Yeah. Maybe you have recordings of them singing. huh? And still to this day, they could be 30 years old and you'd play that little recording of them when they were about four years old singing away. And it's still like music. Oh, it's just so wonderful, isn't it? Well, that's how our heavenly father feels when we sing. And it's the Holy Spirit who prompts us to, to sing. All right. Let's uh, go to chapter six, chapter six, verse one, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Verse five servants be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ obedience. That's the next thing. The Holy spirit is going to help us with, you know, there are some people that really struggle with singing. And there are some people that really struggle with obedience. The Holy Spirit doesn't struggle with either of those. And when he's in control, they flow naturally. All right. Go back to chapter two of Acts. Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two. Please look at verse number 14. Now, I want you to notice that it's Peter doing the speaking, and Peter had a habit of saying the wrong thing. And here's Peter on the day of Pentecost, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Wow. Here's that same Peter who was scared, denied the Lord Jesus and took off crying. Look at chapter four of Acts and verse number, where to go? Eight. There's Peter again, huh? filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, say, come to think of it, he was filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, right? You are. He said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. And on he goes and look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God. They didn't speak in tongues. They spake the word of God with boldness. There's the filling of the Holy Spirit and earnest witnessing. 
Oh, I can't witness. I'm too scared. I don't know what to say. Oh, I'm inexperienced. Oh, I'm no good at it. On and on and on. The excuses dribble from us. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't have a problem with witnessing. And if you want to be a witness, just let the Holy Spirit take over. You'll be a witness. What else? Well, go to chapter 13 of Acts. Acts chapter 13 and verse 52. Read this verse out loud with me, please. Acts 13, 52. Read out loud. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So here is the presence of the Holy Ghost and there is joy. You could write down Ephesians 3.19. You could write that down if you're a note taker because it talks about love. Uh, um, Galatians chapter 6 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, but here's what we're talking about. Abounding with fruit. The Holy Spirit will make your life abound with fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. He'll make these things abound in you. And then if you go, please, back to Ephesians chapter 5. And verse number 21. You want to read it with me, please? Ephesians 5, 21. Read it with me. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, this comes right on the heels of verse 18, which says, be filled with the spirit. And so submitting one to another, submitting one to another. The Holy Spirit has no problem with that. And then one more, if you turn back to the book of Romans, would you do that, please? Romans chapter six. We're just about done here. Romans chapter six. And I'd like you to look at verse number 19. Romans 6, 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Now read these next words out loud. Even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Yielding to righteousness is the the last thing I want to make mention of here. Yielding to holiness. This is uh, an impossible list for every Christian unless they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you'll notice, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's so easy. It's so easy when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good to know? Yeah. Amen. This is the secret, the secret weapon of the born again Christian is the filling of the Holy Spirit. So how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it's not that hard, but we need to confess to God our inability, our weakness, our sin, our misery. We need to confess to him that we just cannot do it. We cannot live the Christian life. We are hopeless failures at living the Christian life. And we need to take God at his word here. We need to yield and allow the Holy Spirit. And we need to ask, Lord, give me that power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please take over in my life. Fill me with Jesus. Let his words be my words. Let his thoughts be my thoughts. And we need to pray that way. And that's the habit you get into. It's not a once for all thing. It's a daily, hour by hour, moment by moment. Be being filled. That's the idea of the present tense. Be filled constantly because you leak. That's why you need to be filled constantly. It's like you're a hole, uh, sorry, you're a bucket with a hole in it. And you fill that bucket up and you say, wow, what's happening here? Well, you got a hole in the bucket, buddy. And it's just pouring right out. You need to keep filling it. Keep filling it. Keep filling it. Keep filling it. The filling of the Holy Spirit. I sure want it. Do you want it in your life? 
Let's bow our heads for prayer. And in prayer, why don't you ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit? First begin and tell the Lord that you just can't do it. You're just not able. It's not in you. Confess your inability. Ask the Lord to forgive any sin that the Holy Spirit brings to mind because he can't and won't fill a dirty vessel. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. To fill you with Jesus. Loving Father, we have so many promises. Even the Lord Jesus told us one of your promises, how that if we being evil know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall our Father, which is in heaven, give the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to them that ask. We know it's your will for us to be filled because you put it as a command. And so please fill us. Fill us tonight. And fill us tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon because, Father, you know, we got a hole in the bucket and we forget and we get busy and we quickly get unfilled. Help us to get in the habit of being filled for your honor, for your glory. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Well, it's our opportunity to worship the Lord with our giving. I've noticed that um, a lot of you bring in your offering envelopes to church and put them in the offering box at the back. And uh, God bless you for that. God bless you for your faithfulness. You can also give online. You are well aware of that. It's an act of worship. We give from our heart because we really love the Lord. And so those of you here tonight in church, you have that opportunity as you leave the auditorium on your way out, the offering box to put in your tithes and your faith promise. And also I'd like to, to remind you that our dear sister Myra has lost everything in a fire. Just her and the children and the dog with the clothes on their back and the fur on the, the back of the dog. That's all they got away with. And so, um, they're trying to rebuild their lives. We've set up a fire relief fund for her. And I'm very, very pleased to say that it's growing, that uh, people are giving. We've not put this out on the internet, like some kind of official GoFundMe. We've not done that. We just wanted to do it as a church family because we believe we need to look after our own. And so I just want to encourage you to give something. You can do that electronically before you leave tonight or anytime you want. That's totally up to you. Now I'd like to say a word or two to those watching at home on the internet. God bless you. Hope that the service has been a wonderful blessing to you. Wish you could have been here. It's like I'm sending you a postcard. Wish you were here. We're having a great time. Miss you. But I want to encourage you to worship the Lord along with us tonight and go to the donation page. And give your tithes and offerings. Would you do that please? That is our wonderful privilege. We're going to call upon Pastor Tim. To come and lead us in our closing hymn. Anywhere with Jesus. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs>